Merci. Well, uh, muchas gracias por este acolio mucho caldo. Uh, um, intento castellano, pero uh, vivo en Italia, hablo italiano y no puedo hacer de más que hablar español. Y para esa cosa hablo en inglés, pero um, uh, las slides <laughs> son en castellano. Um, Alors, euh, mon nom est Derrick de Kerkhov, euh, ex-académico, euh, ahora journaliste, à Roma, euh, travaillant pour une revue mensile, euh, à ma obra espagnole. <laughs> I didn't even realize, but sometimes this happens. I get into the language and I just, you know. Anyway, so no, I work for, uh, I'm a sort of scientific director of this uh, magazine called Media Duemila, and it is a magazine that comes out every month, and it's about technology, digital technology, culture, government, and business. How do they match? How do they mix? What happens with it? And so what I'm going to talk to you about today is, is really part of the work that I do as a thinker, Uh, about our time, and the magazine works on this basis. So, um, apparently I have... Oh, I have a machine, good. So, yeah, I think I know how to use it. I want to talk about the ethics of transparency in the era of big data because we are in a very, very insidious and powerful transformation that we are only half aware of. Half aware of. So I like to see how <laughs> we can handle the other half. Um, this is the first observation. It's, it's the first observation because the culture of the book, the culture of people who read, is a culture of people who take control of language and put it in themselves and they make a personality and an identity because of that. But that's not, the thing. that's not the way kids are growing up now. That's not the way kids who are interacting with screens all the time are growing up. They're growing up with spreading themselves out. Their identity is published. Ours was inside. Opacity. The cultures of the book are opaque. They create walls, divisions, categories, typologies, individuals. Fundamentally, the Western cultures are cultures of very strong individualism encountering electricity. That's the, that's the thing. So, we are moving to transparency, and my best example for that is, I'm talking to you. I say what I want. What I don't say stays in me. Nobody has access to it. But who among you does not have a smartphone? All right, I've got my point. All of us are being traced constantly in every which way, and ever more ways, for tons of reasons, but ones that we don't know ourselves. So, we have to be aware of this possible trans uh, transformation. Big data is nothing but more small data. It's much more than more small data. It is a change of what they call paradigm. It's a change It's a velocity change. Suddenly, the, the world quickens up infinitely faster than it was before. Faster than the Internet let us know it could be. Big data is anything that can be stored somewhere about anything. Climate, 
what, what you buy, uh, what you, you know, where you've been, how is your pulse now? You know, we've got these things and they tell you how many steps you've taken. That too is taken on in big data and it creates information that is actually very useful. What can it do? Look at this. This is my favorite example of them all. Americans, at the end of the year, make New Year's resolutions. Next year, I'll try to be nicer with my neighbor. Next year, I'm going to make myself stronger. Uh, next year, I will make more money. <laughs> so this is the distribution of uh, altruism, the pink. I think I've got a, yes, I do. Altruism, the pink. And you can see there's more pink in bigger quantity in the uh, western side rather than the eastern side, which is more, you know, straight. Uh, the green, where I want to make more money, very evenly distributed. And the blue, how will I be a better person? All right. It's a ridiculous thing. It's, you know, who cares? Well, no, 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 no. a lot of people care. And this is a very small example of what you can find about whole population or point-by-point -point areas, as you will see. I have this friend, artist in Italy, called Salvatore Iconesi. He's a very, very intelligent artist, as well as a beautiful writer. Uh, he recognizes, I do, as you probably will yourself, that we don't live only in one space, this one. We live in this one, and we live in this one. We live in this interactive system. We live in this internet. We live in this total information environment. So that third space, as you can read, uh, is seen by Iaconesi as one of constant interchange of everything that can emanate from a human to another human. Whether it's knowledge, whether it's feelings, whether it's sense of self, we're getting terribly, terribly intimately connected with each other without actually really knowing it. So it's a, it's a good thing to keep in mind. But then, and I think we'll all agree, I'm sure that most of us, you know, think that it's business as usual, that we are the same people, that actually nothing really has changed. Well, no, things have changed, but they have changed underground. Not, not all in your face. So, um, I have actually invented this word, the digital unconscious. Digital unconscious is everything that is known about you that you don't know. And it makes you vote, it makes you buy, it makes you accept, it makes you refuse, it, it makes you do all kinds of things that you didn't know <laughs> you cared about. It's almost more important than Freud and Jung. And it is Jung and Freud, because it's also connective, collective, and private. All the personas that people are building about each one of us on the internet for their own purpose, big business does it. Government do it. So this digital unconscious is an underground of our own identity as individual and our behavior as people. So how do we occupy this third space? Well, there is all the stuff that, you know, are easily traceable, collatable, uh, what I like, where to join me, uh, what do people say about me, what do I buy, who do I know, what do I know, what do I choose, what sports, what's my hobbies, all of that can actually be, with big data, put together very quickly to just pinpoint you. And if, if it's not enough, then I have 64 different sources of legitimate information. No, we're not talking about the deep web. We're talking about stuff available by any good hacker or anybody who knows how to play big data. So these are all the sources of information that are about us, and it's just the same in Chile as it is in, in Rome or, or, or in Toronto, for that matter. Then we have this stuff. We, okay, I know Google Glass is not really doing very well, but it's going to come back. 
Why? Because it's not finished. So we've got this stuff, and we have this total surround of information that, you know, just, just, just there. I mean, I'll be there right now in Valparaiso, but it won't be long. So, here's an exaggeration, but if you want to understand what's coming on, you have to exaggerate. I'm imagining good glass, no? And I'm putting together vitrionics. Vitrionics allows you to actually use your eye as a camera. So see from your own point of view. Emotive, a system that actually captures your emotion, but not only that, allows you, I'll show you, to think something and make it happen on a screen. So then you add to that GPS, you all know what GPS is, where, what, where am I? And then facial recognition, which has already proven itself, as you will see. You put that with big data, and you're in a total surround of information that's in contact with you all the time. So it, you have a culture of transparency and total visibility. I don't know whether you have thought about this before, but it doesn't matter how many times I think about it, it always comes back to me as, wow, that's, that's a civilizational change, not just you know, a technological one. Vitrionics. Technology is being developed. You can see these little things you have. You can actually imprint directly on this system. It's not just like you know, a screen literally in your face. This is the way it would work, antennas. You can miniaturize things in such a way and make them transparent, and so you basically have no problem wearing these contact lenses. Here is the, sorry, I just jumped up. I tried this, this is what I called, uh, the, it, you can buy this on, on the internet, just go emotive and you can come in, you know, it's 100, uh, I don't know, maybe $150 or something like this, but nothing very expensive. And what it is, you put this on your head and you have to, you have to turn all this color here, whoops, sorry, all, all this color here, you have to bring it to blue. And how you do it is, you sort of watch it, and after about a minute, I saw that there was a blueness somewhere, and I thought, I just was pushing this blueness with my mind, it became all blue, and boom, I was ready. And then this lady asked me to, uh, to move this little square here, and move it one way, the other way. So yeah, I, I, again, she said, move it to the right, and then I sort of, eh, I sort of, and then he went to the right. I did do two or three of this. Then I said, look, don't talk to me. I want to decide what I want to do myself, and you won't know. And so I decided, disappear. You know, get the cube out of the screen. And it did. So I was convinced. And I am convinced that this is just a very naive beginning of connection between the brain and the system, and it all is based on the zero-one system. So it's very easy to create an off-and-on relationship. Okay, so uh, GPS, you got that. Uh, facial recognition. This is a Chennaif boy who was, who was followed and found by the Boston police at the, after the Boston uh, March bombing. And it just tells you how it works, how you different. Apparently, each, each one of our face is like uh, the digital mark of your finger. It's unique. The exact distance between eye, nose, mouth, cheekbones is absolutely unique. And you have machines now who are sufficiently finely tuned to discover that uniqueness across an infinity of possibilities. That's really, it's really astounding in itself. Uh, so we basically have a, a transparency of the digital person uh, and, and kind, of, a kind of reversal. Do you, did anybody see Person of Interest? Yeah, it's a good series. It's a good series because what it does, it tells us exactly what's happening and, sh and sort of explores what one could do if one had the reflexes of the 21st century, which we won't have when we finally get in the situation where a machine can actually see and say and predict all of us. It's already there to a certain extent. 
This one is the way by which the two brothers, Charnaif, were actually found. They simply followed the unique code of their cell phone, which I don't know how they got, but they got it through the big data phone. And then by finding out, when, as those two telephones were actually always together, so in the same physical space, like the real GPS thing, they just followed, and then that's when they started uh, chasing them out. Here are dozens of systems that are in collaboration for informing on the, you know, prison, uh, the CIA, the various, uh, the, the various sort of database collection that are done, and you all know about WikiLeaks, or you all know about Snowden, and you know, you know about these things. We'll come back to it. Um, uh oh, it died. No, no, it's not happy at all. What do we do? <laughs> Maybe it's, it's this problem, let's see. Okay, so we, yeah, we have, a, we have a, an anxiety that is developing right now, but it's, it's very unconscious. I want to get back to that at the end. What is our unconscious condition? What is our semi-conscious sensibility? I want to get to that. Oh yeah, I want to get to this too, rapidly, because of a Spanish culture, you all know about the Inquisition. The Inquisition was the transition moment between the time when the culture was oral to the time when the culture became written, literate. The opacity begins with the cell of the individual cells of the monks of the various religious order of the time. The opacity begins with Ignacio de Loyola, who teaches each one of these children with the Ratio Studiorum to become an individual, right? But then the opacity also represents the destruction or the threat of the previous system. Hence, we have a religious order that tortures people to get into their body, to get to the secret, the questio, which was so legitimate religious-wise. So we want to avoid that. Because that happened as a consequence of a change of ground for language to flourish. And the new change of ground is the electronic one, so we have to deal with that as well. We want to avoid this. We really do. And we are pretty close to getting it. Come on, guys. Ah, sorry about that. Oh, it does it. Yeah, I like this image. The only thing is, what's wonderful for us, <laughs> for you and for me, just in case, they don't have to torture you anymore. They don't have to talk to you either. <laughs> what question? What question? What question is the future of education? In big data, who cares about the answer? They're all there. They're all there. Or they're nowhere. And then you ask the question, you get the answer. It's the first time in history, first time in the history of human knowledge when you have such a situation where there's no archive, where there's no previous idea. So it's really funny. Uh, good, it works. So we talked about Snowden, FBI, and you know, discussing with Google and Apple, the big companies trying to resist government control. All of this is actually going on, but we find that it's uh, it's very difficult to avoid, uh, to, uh, you know, to really control the government in such a way that it doesn't take absolute control. This is a very powerful concept by um, uh, Vaidyanathan, Shiva Vaidyanathan. Those of you who have been trained in political science probably have heard about the Panopticon by Jeremy Bentham. The Panopticon is a prison system that Bentham invented in order to cut down on the employees of the prison guards, so that you would have one central area which would look into a big spoke world of all the cells, and you could just keep your eyes wherever you are. You didn't have to have a mirror door outside, you just sort of turn around. The panopticon has been used often to talk about the way the state, or whatever you know, totalitarian state, uh, what are the practices of these states and how, what do they do. But this is the observation. Vaidyanathan says, no, 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 no. We're not in a panopticon anymore. We are in a non-opticon. And the non-opticon is when you don't know if or when, for why, you are going to be watched. 
you don't have any sense of, any, of, of the context. Kaplan says himself, he says, it's, it's a condition that gives us a, a, a new vulnerability, this condition of not knowing where the next shot will come from. People have no idea, they don't, they, they don't, they don't, they don't actually get uh, involved with the decisions. So it affects, it's a, it creates a frustrating relationship between governed and governors. Uh, for the moment, for the moment, the ones who are actually managing our world, virtual connections and so on, are, are perfectly ready uh, to make it, uh, you know, uh, business as usual. Say, well, nothing really has changed. Nobody will want to underline the fact that actually that situation has changed completely. So, you know, they pretend that the transparency is, uh, is actually happening and, uh, in fact, uh, all of these things are under control. But the power is, is decentralized. Everything is decentralized. Everything is redistributed. Even Arduinos, for those who are geeks, are distribution of a computing power. And now, transparency is moving from institution, from government to bank, institution, individuals. The move from WikiLeaks to SwissLeaks about who was actually putting money in Swiss banks. That's a move from the institution to the individual. And these are big individuals, so they're the first comers, first served, so to speak. But well, we can all be next. Volkswagen? Wow. Reputation is everything today. And it's online. So, uh, we have to be very careful how the power handles it. Reverse of public and private. What inside goes outside, poured into the screen, on the internet, our inside is constantly being poured out, and inside we get the feedback from a system that is telling us what to think. Okay, I'll skip some of that for the basis of, uh, for the basis of, of brevity, but uh, Absence of context. You know, the information is, is not contextualized for or by you, it's contextualized for and by other people to see how you fit in that system for their purpose. Uh, the decentralization is complete. It's spatial, it doesn't matter where you ask the information. It's social. It goes way beyond the limits of what you normally allow people to have access to. That means you don't control who has the information, and it goes on forever. It goes on forever. Paradox, actually, fundamentally, nobody cares. But that's serious. Nobody cared at the Council of Trent when the culture was moving from blah blah to reading. That's what's happening. So, control, responsibility, it's not their responsibility. They'd like to have control, but they don't use it. Uh, they don't really care too much about their private life. They say they do, but then again, they publish anything anyway. Uh, and then, of course, the awareness of it is getting sort of more and more dim, less and less, you know, important. But this is the, tr this is the thing, the, the, the reputation capital is becoming more significant than anything to do with money. Anybody heard about uh, Ashley Madison? You know, when all the uh, a hacker got into the emails uh, of all the people uh, who were connecting on this encounter site, and started publishing it. Again, the information leaks, will leak, and always leaks. So you can be sure of that. But here is the deeper thought. The deeper thought is that this is the return of a culture that we have known before, a long time ago. Even the First Nations of this country. A, s a sense of shame, not guilt. A sense of being involved with the other, 
the family, the clan, the tribe. A sense of honor. A very strong sense of honor. In a culture of individuals, the thing has become a culture of guilt. My, I am responsible to myself. I have a destiny. Whereas the destiny of the clan, of the group, was what was important in the oral culture. And now, something new is happening in the same order of things, but with the difference that it's very fast, very large, very global. So it's moving all kinds of directions that we can't predict. So the return of the culture of shame. Think about it. Shame, my responsibility is to the other. Guilt, my responsibility is to myself. What do we call environmental awareness or global awareness or transculturalism? We don't have the right word for what corresponds to shame and guilt in our time, but I've heard today that poets create the world, and I'm sure that a poet will find the right word to describe the situation in which we are. I tried anxiety, but it's too weak. Anyway. <clears throat> Oh yeah, I have a <laughs> this friend, Mark Federman, who is brilliant and has created this concept of publicity. In English, publicity is publicness and privacy put together, so it's one of these weird, entangled situations we have with our own body and, 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 our, and our environment. Uh, how can we know our multiple identities? How can we give a sense to this holographic construction of ourselves? Can, how can we protect ourselves against technology that changes us into mercantile, into basically uh, commercial product? How can we create a critical pedagogy? I'd say we should have the Jesuit 2.0, who teach us the world based on digital. We haven't got that yet. And if we encountered ourselves in an obscure cyberspace, would we recognize ourselves if we found our profile? So these are good questions about the future. Uh, and here are some answers by artists. I like artists because artists always know about the future. This woman has decided that she is going to go public with her private things. So she decided to take her, uh, her couch, and, uh, and it was cold, so she had her heater, and then she had, uh, and she was doing a, a, fa a Facebook exchange with her friends publicly, and people would just sort of, you know, walk like this, and they would say, well, you know, "What are you doing?" Oh, she said, "Well, you know, I might as well do it here." <laughs> you know, it's, anyway, it's, uh, everybody has access to it, so the, the, there's no reason why I should hide. Uh, it's just fine being here. Uh, this one, I love this thing by Usman Hake. He created a, a jewel that you can put. And he creates an aura of uh, brouillage. I don't know how you say this in English. Um, scrambling. Scramble, 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 and there is no way you can unscramble, which means that you are basically in an aura of protection from the, uh, uh, any kind of... You can't call, but nobody can call you, and nobody can see you. Uh, another one which I think is delightful is kill your phone. This man has invented a little pocket which has the same kind of effect as of scrambling. You put your phone in it, carry that thing in you, and bingo, you're inaccessible. So this is an artist's view of where we're going. Uh, this is actually, I believe that these are uh, Spanish uh, artists. They tell us where the government's taking us. I think it's an important thing. Here's another protest by Andrea Bowers, all kinds of ideas for posters about how people are taking advantage of us and how we are losing our rights. For example, uh, ignore your rights and they will go away. Uh, issues of, well, anyway, so artists are actually concerned about these things and they are helpful. Uh, strategies of uh, defense, a very intelligent, brilliant cons uh, discussion, uh, a man who really knows about this culture, Victor Mario Schoenberger, thinks we should have a system like Snapchat. You know Snapchat, when you send a photograph, you know you can time the amount of time you want it to continue. It's very, very successful with kids. They love just exchanging. It's like exchanging their imagination in real time, and then it goes away. And so why don't we do that with our internet? Why don't we have a Snapchat model? 
Uh, Firefox, Track Me Not, Amnesty International allows journalists to know when they are being followed, so these are important. Uh, but the point is, we should have, we, we should deal with these three, three things, protection, definition, and regulation of the amount of, um, of, of you know, access we have. We should be empowered rather than being disenfranchised from any information that we are getting. Uh, we've been working on this. Uh, as what I would like, what I would like uh, uh, as a software and as a technology to protect myself would be something that would accompany every move that I do with my cell phone, uh, on my screen, wherever I'm dealing with something electronic, I would want something that would allow me to follow this. And this can be realized today, perhaps, by what's called blockchain, which is a technology used by uh, Bitcoin in order to, to create secure transactions. But it's slow. The idea is, how can you accelerate it to make it real-time? That's, the, that's, the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the, the challenge, would I say. Uh, we should have access. We should have right to access to anything that is published about us. We should have right of reuse. The idea was be to even make an economy of the person. Look, I'll read your advertising, I'll buy your stuff, you can use my data, but it will be against some kind of retribution. So that can be, that can be imagined as well. Elements of new ethics. First of all, we require our schools to teach our children to deal with their personality online. Make that a competence. Uh, we should be able to expand uh, the, the sharing of all the information. Adopt transculturalism. That's a seriously important kind of attitude. And then uh, this consciousness, which is de developing anyway, of the, of the environment, which is key. It is actually it's becoming very much the case. Will there be a new aristocracy? Will you be able, when everything is known about you, not to pay your taxes? No, frankly. It's, and the point is, just imagine that that's exactly what it is, that everything can be all the time known about you. But you are still very different from your next door person. So you have a very strong identity still, and you have a very strong community still. And they both together, and how do you handle that? That's the, that's the question. And you are aristocracy, yes, because if you actually do your best for your community, you become a person of good, which is Aristo, power of Aristos. The sense of honor. The sense of honor in a situation like this. You know, in a tribal culture, everything is known about everybody all the time, so it's a situation which is very much like our own. But then there is a very strong sense of honor. And I think it may come back. Three responsibilities. The oral culture, as I said, is, ver is versus the other, versus oneself in the literate culture, and then a complete change of scale. A complete change of scale. We are all global. We're all completely global. Um, let me see, how much time do I still have? Maybe not much. Oh, no, no, I do. I, I'm, I'm supposed to talk, uh, you know, <laughs> I have another five or six minutes. Uh, so I'll go on. I hope you're not, you're not you know, bored, but I, th I find this very, very, I mean, I find all of this very, very urgent. Uh, so uh, what kind of equilibrium can we, can we deal with in this new condition? Having access to our digital persona, know what, who they are, being able to change or wherever it's legal to change them, correct them. It, these things are always say, full of mistakes, too, you know. Uh, probably a new conformism. I don't think it will be fascist, although fascism is very much, very much made easier by electronic media. So we've got to deal with that as well in terms of, you know. I'm, I'm pleased to see that re recent news 
that China, the Politburo, the, the big, big guys of the Chinese government, have actually begun a consulting process using the internet across, I think, 4,000 people who are in their power environment. They never did that before. So this consulting thing, if it happens in China, it'll happen everywhere, if it's not already. Oh, yeah. Um, Sex. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't expect me to talk about sex. But anyway, uh, every time that a, a, our relationship to, our langu to language changes, our relationship to our body changes, because our relationship to our mind changes. So that physically we have very different kind of responses to the environment, including the sensibility of our skin, depending on what kind of system is supporting our daily life. So it's very key to, to, to understand how this happens. So sexuality is, it is controlled in tribal society, but it's a lot less, it's, not, it's given a lot less attention, which is huge. Sexuality has received huge attention in the West. Uh, and sexual anxiety is not exclusively a Western thing, but dominantly a Western thing. It comes from the fact that suddenly you have a vision of yourself as being more important than you, others, and also because basically that's, you know, that's a system that you are be you're becoming more and more personally aware of. So how, what, what would happen? Can we abandon it? Today, you know, we know that a you know, quarter of the internet is porn, porn, uh, porn sites. So, so what? At some point, you have to say, so what? Let it be. Lose it. Move on. Uh, yeah, then the idea of government and so on. But I'll, I'll move on. No, the idea, of course, of government is that we would like it in a society where we are all sharing space and cyberspace. We would like it to have a situation where there is some sort of symmetry and some sort of equilibrium. You know everything about me? Good. I'd like to know everything about you. I'll tell you a story. In Canada, the Minister of the Interior had asked government or parliament if he could install systems by the Royal Mounted, Canadian Mounted Police, that is La Guardia de Financia, that is the people of the police who take care of criminality and social order, if they would be allowed to get into your computer, well, you're not Canadian, okay, Canadian computers anyway, to find out if, you know, uh, you, you actually had done something wrong or you were going, the big machine we were talking about before. So then, you know, uh, Anonymous, remember the, the guys who put on the face, put on the face mask? Anonymous went down the street and they said, this is against the law, it's against the constitution, we are against this sort of thing. The government response was, oh, who cares about a bunch of, you know, masked individuals? And they continued, hmm, good, said Anonymous. I am going to find out about the Minister of Culture's divorce over the last three months, and, the, and, and I will publish the whole exchange between him, his wife, and their lawyers. Better than a novel. No, no, I mean it. So, this was then, let's say, this was just before, this happened before we discovered about PRISM and about the American center, Bluffdale, <laughs> I love the title, where they have all these machines that are spying on us. Uh, but but it, 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 sort of, it sort of tells the story because that law was not passed in Canada. There was like, they calmed down. We are a reasonably democratic country in Canada, I have to say, nothing to worry about. <clears throat> but I just wanted to sort of semi, I have two, I have two ways of, of dealing with the end of this. <sighs> yeah, first of all, freedom. Freedom is a myth, particularly in Hispanic culture. Libertad, libertador, freedom is a, a huge value. In French, too, you know, we have liberté, égalité, fraternité. Uh, freedom is also enshrined in the American Constitution. 
The point is, freedom is a huge value in the cultures of private identity. And it is manifested by the feeling that there is no obstacle, no reasonable obstacle to how I would like to live my, take, uh, live my life. Um, to be transparent doesn't mean that you are prisoners of transparency. See, the way I talk about this, you, you, you think that I am sort of, you know, trying to scare you. No, no, no. I'm just suggesting that these are things that are happening, but we have to know how to react to them. That's the, you know, there's, no, there's no fear to have, but there is really attention to give. So we need to evolve in the same way, as I, you know, as I said before, we need to evolve in cyberspace the same way we evolve in real space, having control of who we are. We need to have control on our data, and freedom will always depend, and now more than ever, between, of an equilibrium between the demands of security, which is becoming really serious worldwide, hasn't hit, you know, it hasn't hit uh, uh, Valparaiso, I think, and it's not, you know, but it's anywhere in the world now, you are not safe because of terrorism, because of the distribution of the menace. It's absolutely global. So we need an equilibrium between security and autonomy. And these are tensions. They don't agree with each other. To be spied all the time, to have our face on all the system, to be able to get somebody catching our name because the name is connected with pictures and it appears on Facebook, and on Facebook you just mouse over and you get the name. Sorry to be fast, but I mean, you know, it's just one thought. The idea is uh, from face recognition to access to the person and that person's name is like no problem at all. So, so where is it, where, where's our freedom there? Where is our autonomy? How do we reconcile the world of the inside and this incredible outside that keeps growing? That's, a, that's a sort of a question I'm asking myself. And I have ended here, ended here because Marshall McLuhan, who I worked for 10 years with Marshall McLuhan, and he was one of the, the most important thinkers I, that I understand in my lifetime. Uh, and I think among the things that he had said, the most beautiful and the most powerful thing that he had said was in the electronic age, we wear all mankind as our skin. That's a very, very powerful statement. Because we are. Because we are. That's what I wanted to conclude on. And I've, I've written a few notes because I didn't have the time to translate them in, in Spanish. What we must understand is the transparency of each one of us is complemented by the transparency of the world. Transparency goes both ways. We get the world in our face all the time, brutally, the whole of it. Reminds me of the quake, the tremor last night. I mean, you guys are used to it, but I'm not. And for, you know, almost a minute, I was shaking, wondering, that's, that's the world in real time. So anyway, I just, that's what we are living in, having access to everything, information in every, every way. So the rise of visibility of the self is complemented, as I said, by this. The world in real time, and in your face, hyper-visible, almost obscene. The obscenities, we are spared the obscenities of decapitation, for example. But it, the rest of television and the rest of the images that are being distributed are just as obscene. They may not be erotic, they may not be forbidden, but they are right in your face. The world is in your face. So, each one of us experiences personal stress or enjoyment in any different times of our life. Under it is the stress we experience on the condition of the world. It's 
very unconscious. It's very different. It's made of, you know, uh, the vulnerabil vulnerability that we have now, very different from the time when there was parity of the nuclear parity between the Russians and the Americans. Now, as I said, everything is being distributed. We are much more vulnerable. And we distrust more and more the people in charge. Distrust more and more the people in charge for good reasons. How can we continue then to accept that situation? What kind of order, using what media today of communication and mutual understanding, dialoguing and consulting can help us to deal with a situation like that one? Because it's one thing to, to manage my feelings about who I am, my identity and what is known about me. It's another thing to, how do I deal with the community anyway? And I think we are going back from the individualist dominant to a community dominant, but we don't know quite how yet. Although many, many, many communities exist online, we don't know quite the, the rules of, of such matters. One thing we can say, and I will conclude here, the Internet acts as a limbic system. The limbic system is what in your body creates, produces, and actually develops emotions, and those emotions sometimes end up in gesture or plans or whatever. But the limbic system creates emotion. The Internet is now a social limbic system for the whole world. It has enormous new powers that haven't been tried. For example, it's been discovered that if you sell the good news to somebody in a hub, a hub is like you know, near a hub, some, a hub is a certain person who actually has access and produces access to many other people. If you produce a certain kind of good news there, you will find that even the people who don't know what the good news is about are actually going to have a moment of relief. This means that on the Internet, as a limbic system, emotions are not only communicated as information, but also as effect. And so that's one thing we can count on. So, in an ethics of sharing, you know, which is an open system, and we talk about open system, we talk about sharing, and we talk about you know, somehow behaving in a, in, a, in a sort of a social way, everybody becomes responsible for the welfare of the community. And I can't end better than by saying that Puertos de Ideas is exactly this kind of responsibility towards the community and how it is being practiced. Well, that's all I had to say.